Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Salmon. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors here at the club and I'm a reporter with Congressional Quarterly. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests today in the audience as well as those of you watching this program on C-SPAN or listening to it on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Before introducing our head table, I'd like to remind guests of some of our upcoming speakers. On Wednesday, March 15th, Peter Arnett, the CNN correspondent, will be the speaker uh, for our Freedom of Information Day Awards Luncheon. On Friday, March 17, John Bruton, the Irish Prime Minister, will address the Press Club audience. And on Thursday, March 30, we have Rudolph Giuliani, the mayor of New York City. Transcripts and audio tapes, as well as videotapes of Press Club luncheons, are available by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them at the cards at your table and pass them up here and they'll be passed to me. I'll ask as many as time permits. I'd like now to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly while their names are called. From your right, Carl Hartman of the Associated Press, Mick Rood, who's the treasurer of the National Press Club, K. Terry Dornbush, the United States Ambassador to the Netherlands, Oscar Garskargen, the North American correspondent for De Volksgrant, which loosely translates into the People's Paper. Uh, People's Daily, he said not to confuse that with the Chinese paper. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, Hans von Mierlo, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, who is also a Vice Prime Minister. Skipping briefly over our speaker, Mark Johnson of Media General, who is the Chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Adrian Zakobovic de Zeged, the Netherlands Ambassador to the United States. William Hickman, Editor and Publisher of Public Policy Publishing and a member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who organized today's luncheon. Catherine Turpin of the Foreign Press Center and James Anderson of the German Press Agency. I'd also like to thank staff members Melissa Bender, Pat Nelson, and Melanie Abdal Dermott, and Jeff Tarbell for helping in today's organization. The Dutch have created what is surely one of the most liberal societies on the planet. They tolerate drug usage, prostitution is allowed, although none of it is represented here at the head table. <laughs> it has a social welfare system that is considered so sweeping and inclusive that even the Swedes and Danes blush by comparison. Fair to say House Speaker Newt Gingrich and the conservative contract with America is based on anything but the lifestyle and government doctrine of the Netherlands. But that said, consider this. In the Netherlands, literacy is 99%. Economic growth is a fair 1.4%. Inflation, 1.3%. Life expectancy for women, 80. For men, 73. It is the country with whom the United States enjoys its largest single trading surplus. And only citizens of two other countries own more real estate in the United States than the Dutch. With fewer than 15 million people, the Netherlands is a statuesque player in world affairs, particularly in their working relationship with the United States. In a small area of fertile land, the Dutch are major agricultural exporters, and it's not all tulips. There's some azaleas and some other plant products that come over there as well. <laughs> Seriously, their chemical and pharmaceutical industries are uh, considered large and respected across the world. And like most island nations, the Netherlands is a vigorous free trader. Despite some recent friction over global environmental uh, matters, the U.S. and the Dutch enjoy an excellent relationship. Not surprising, today's speaker is daily involved in the affairs of of uh, the European Commission, of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and the World Trade Organization. Wim Kok, the Dutch Prime Minister, a former trade unionist, has been Prime Minister since last fall when he was asked to organize a coalition government by Queen Beatrix. 
He was serving as head of the left of center Labor Party, which garnered the largest number of votes in a June election. But even before then, before the election, when the Netherlands was headed by a right of center coalition government, Mr. Koch was deputy prime minister and minister of finance. Friends and foes alike credit him with being fiscally responsible socialist. This is no small feat for a man who in 1989 was elected deputy chairman of the Socialist International Party. From 1973 until 1985, he was organized labor's top official as chairman of the Netherlands Federation of Trade Unions. This compares with the AFL-CIO. As Americans, we have a special reason for being grateful to Mr. Koch and to the Dutch. In 1776, the Netherlands was the first country to recognize the independence of the then small and insignificant United States of America. It may be the last, however, to sign on with the contract with America. <laughs> Please give Dutch Prime Minister Wim Koch a warm National Press Club welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for this uh, nice introduction and for your kind invitation to be here today. And it's indeed a privilege to join you. And uh, this afternoon, I want to talk about two related items. As Prime Minister of a country with a long history as a trading nation, I want to look at developments in international trade that are of uh, importance to both the USA and the Netherlands. And then I would like to discuss future relations between the European Union and the United States within the framework of our broader international responsibilities. My theme today is partnership. Partnership of friends, allies, competitors. Partnership based on shared values, on shared goals, and on shared benefits. But first, uh, I also want to talk briefly about the 200-year-old ties between the United States and the Netherlands. And it uh, was just said, the story of U.S.-Netherlands relations begins on that day in November, the 16th of November, 1776, when Dutch forces on the island of St. Eustatius returned the salute of the American brig of war, the Andrew Doria, as she sailed into the harbor of St. Eustatius. This first salute marked the first time that the foreign nation recognized the sovereignty of the heretofore rebel colony, and we Dutch are proud that we fired that first salute. And of course, uh, quite a debate is possible about if we did it the right way, yes or no, but anyhow, uh, we, took, we, took, we took a right decision. We are generally humble, uh, at least that's what we state in public, uh, and we like to believe that we are shrewd and know a good investment when we see one. And I think this first salute is proof of our seeing something of great value that others may have overlooked. <laughs> the Netherlands entered into official diplomatic relations with the US on the 19th of April uh, 1782, uh, six years later, when John Adams, your second president, presented his credentials to the States General of our uh, United Provinces, thus making the Netherlands the second country after France to recognize the fledgling republic. By the way, France changed in those years from a monarchy into a republic, but my country did it the other way around. We switched from a republic to a, into a monarchy, and still today we don't regret this choice. A treaty of friendship and trade was signed and Adams' most important task was to secure loans. Loans for his young country, which he did from Amsterdam banking houses. And John Adams believed that in all of Europe, there was, I quote, no better station than The Hague to collect intelligence from Spain, from France, England, Germany, and all the northern parts, nor a better situation from whence to circulate intelligence through all parts of Europe. What Adams was speaking of was uh, the Netherlands' prime central location. And just as it helped him gather intelligence about Europe, 
Today, the Netherlands tries to serve as a stepping stone for many companies looking to tap into the European market. It is no surprise that 70% of all U.S. exports to Europe enter the continent through Rotterdam, the largest port in the world, nor would Adams be surprised to learn that thousands of European of U.S. business, uh, large and small, have established their European headquarters in my country. The decision-making process in the old Dutch Republic was impenetrable to a foreigner, causing Adams to remark, and there I quote again, that the councils of this people are the most inscrutable of any I ever saw. Uh, while that may still be true today, I am happy to report that for those of you familiar with the intricacies of Congress or the machinations of the EU, we Dutch believe that others have ousted the Netherlands from its former preeminence in this regard. Let me return now to the present day. As we approach the end of the 20th century, the international community faces great economic changes. First, the integration, of course, of the former communist bloc into the international economic order. Second, the globalization of production and trade. And third, the steady increase of Asia's economic power. Each of these changes reinforce the economic interdependence between different regions of the world, including that between these and Europe. To fully reap the benefits of this growing interdependence, strong multilateral cooperation, partnership, and an open climate of trade and investment between countries called for. In the coming years, trade will be of key importance to our economic growth. The recently established World Trade Organization will encourage structural adjustment within countries, provided that they are prepared to abide by the letter and spirit of the multilateral rules and binding settlement of disputes. All countries should play by the same rules and be bound by the same rules. This implies renouncing unilateralism and trade controls. And this means, for example, that we have to accept, whether we like it or not, that several developing countries have lower labor costs than we have. Another challenging feature of the multilateral trading system is the extensive incorporation of world commerce into many different forms of regional integration. Since the conclusion of the Uruguay Round, regionalism appears to be accelerating markedly. With important developments in APEC and MERCOSUR, the, the European Union moving further towards integrating parts of Eastern Europe, the possibility of a Pan-American free trade zone, and a range of initiatives elsewhere. I endorse the legitimate political and economic objectives which underlie these developments. We should strive to ensure, however, that these initiatives serve as building blocks of multilateral cooperation for the liberalization of trade and investment. And here, the WTO I just mentioned has an important role to play, for which the full support of the two main pillars of multilateralism, the United States and the European Union, is indispensable. Regional economic policies cannot produce an alternative system to the GET WTO framework. Policies should be formulated to support and complement the multilateral system. Otherwise, the latent danger that the trading system could disintegrate into inward-looking regional blocks could loom larger. And then, the long-standing idea of establishing a transatlantic free trade area linking the North American and European economies to consolidate our trans transatlantic relations is coming up uh, in our discussion again. No doubt, the United States and the European Union have a fundamental interest to ensure that their mutual economic ties remain strong and productive. And new ideas and new initiatives to strengthen this are most welcome. But we should be careful 
not to draw the wrong conclusion from a correct analysis. Our common interest is to make multilateral liberalization a top priority, and the existence of that should uh, not be uh, taken for granted. You might be surprised to learn that the Netherlands is the third largest exporter of agricultural products in the world. Indeed, tulips, herrings, Heineken, and a little bit more. Uh, while a free market for trade in agricultural products does not exist on either side of the Atlantic, the Netherlands is one of the least protectionist countries within the limitations of the uh, EU's common agricultural policy. Agricultural exports were 16% of total Dutch exports to the US in 1992, and 14% of US exports to the Netherlands in 1992 were of that nature, agricultural products. This is a further proof of what partnership and common interest can bring to the transatlantic uh, relationship. Just how much interest we have in each other's prosperity can be illustrated with a few figures on trade and investment. The sum involved in the trade of merchandise between the US and the EU is $200 billion a year almost 20% of total U.S. trade. And the European internal market absorbs on a permanent basis approximately one quarter of all American exports, roughly $100 billion, which is double the total U.S. exports to Japan. Furthermore, the balance of trade between Europe and the U.S. is permanently in a state of equilibrium in contrast to the clear negative balance of trade for the U.S. in Asia. On the investment side, 40% of U.S. foreign direct investment goes to the European Union, compared with 15% to the Pacific Rim. European countries account for over half of foreign direct investment in the U.S., which is two and a half times larger than investments from Asia. In simpler terms, this means high-quality jobs for 3 million Americans, not including spin of employment. As for my own country, for many years the Netherlands has been, after Japan and the United Kingdom, the third largest foreign investor in this country, while the U.S. is the number one foreign investor in the Netherlands. Total Dutch direct investment in the United States stands at nearly $70 billion. What all of this means is simple. We Europeans, and we Dutch in general in particular, great, greatly value the open investment climate that traditionally prevails in this country. However, there is some reason for concern about the pressure in Congress to introduce tighter requirements for foreign investment in the US and about exceptions to national treatment, for instance, in subsidies for research and development. Thus, the time has come for us partners to agree to work through these problems calmly and rationally. This is already taking shape in uh, that our two nations agree that we should commence OECD negotiations on a comprehensive multilateral investment agreement. I believe that such an agreement should be binding on both federal and state authorities and should, in principle, admit no exceptions to national treatment. If such an agreement were negotiated, it could subsequently serve as a basis for talks in that WTO. And this would, in turn, demonstrate the American-Dutch interest and leadership in promoting free trade, and further prove the value of the partnership, which is at the center of our relationship and the theme of my address today. Let me now, ladies and gentlemen, say a few words on the future relations between the US and the European Union and on the path on which transatlantic relations could move in the future. We need a full-scale political partnership between the US and Europe. And this partnership should complement the NATO treaty-based security cooperation. In my view, and in this context, Partnership means commitment. Commitment to seek common approaches to problems based on a framework 
of shared values and consultation. Europe and the US are essentially one community, a transatlantic community of shared values and a community unparalleled anywhere in the world. Community, of course, implies shared interests. And community generates great responsibilities. And members of a community form partnerships based on their shared interests to meet these responsibilities. For our purpose, this means that members of the transatlantic community have much to do that can benefit their own interests as well as the interests of the community and mankind in general. It is essential that the United States and the European Union join forces, join forces to tackle the international, political and economic issues of the day. To begin with, we should do so in Central and Eastern Europe and in the countries of the Commonwealth of Independent States. Stabilizing the situation in the eastern half of Europe is the matter that transcends mere regional significance. I shall return to this point in a moment. But it is not only in Europe that the transatlantic partners have interests in common. We must convince Japan that more de deregulation of its economy is desirable. In relation to China and East Asia, too, our interests run parallel to a large extent. And other important points are the fight against drug trafficking and money laundering and clearing up the nuclear, chemical and biological legacies of the Cold War to ensure that they do not fall into the wrong hands. International terrorism, whether of the political, uh, religious or unalterated criminal variety, poses an immense challenge to security on both sides of the Atlantic. With organized crime, we have an international actor on our hands with a gross national product of nearly $850 billion. Nor can we shut our eyes to the problems of sub-Saharan Africa. There are countries in danger of sinking into ethnic conflict, famine, and anarchy. Last but not least, we have a shared task of championing the cause of human rights throughout the world. And this, altogether, seems to me a pretty full agenda for widening our transatlantic relations, an agenda that brings the next century into view. We have been talking in our part of the world and working also on European integration for something like 40 years. And while the European uh, Commission, the European Community had only a relatively small number of member states, uh, use of the word European could in truth be regarded as presumptuous. But since the collapse of the Berlin Wall, we in Western Europe have been faced with the challenge of translating that presumption into a promise. The first steps have been taken with the acceptance in principle of the accession of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. However, the challenge this presents is quite different from that posed by the recent accession of Austria, Sweden and Finland. Enlargement towards the East compels us to make every effort to keep the institutions of the European uh, Union effective. The provisions of the Maastricht Treaty do not go far enough to resolve the institutional problems involved. And that is why we must make progress in this direction in 1996. However, the countries in Eastern Europe that aspire to EU membership will also have to prepare themselves thoroughly for their accession. Until then, the Union must guarantee them a judicious mix of market access on one hand and assistance on the other hand. The European Union is also confronted with major internal changes, challenges. The first is the consolidation of the internal market. In the end, the driving force behind economic recovery in Europe can only come from the combination of internal markets and economic and monetary union. Only then will Europe be able to benefit fully from the completion of the internal market. 
that achievement will also represent the cornerstone of European political union, which is still some ways off. This process has far-reaching consequences for the domestic policies of the individual member states. For that reason, every effort has been made to preserve political support for the European integration. Another challenge is posed by the need to strike the right balance in the democratic structures at both national and European level. The European Union is beset by the tension that exists between the fact that many of our problems are supranational and the limited political and cultural capacity in each country to come to terms with that fact. How can we find, for example, a European answer to the problem of unemployment while at the same time maintaining an affordable safety net for the weakest among us? In other words, Europe will have to act more forcefully and with greater conviction both internally and externally. And this brings me to the common challenge facing the US and the EU on the continent of Europe. Europe's security problems is so, are so complex and extensive, largely because of the uncertainties associated with the transformation of the former Soviet Union, that there can be no question of a purely European solution. Another ch uh, the scale of the problem calls for a transatlantic approach. Stability can only be made to extend eastward by means of close cooperation between the European Union, the Western European Union, NATO and the OSCE. And both the European Union and NATO have a distinct role to play in promoting stability throughout Europe as a whole. I have indicated how much preparatory work the EU and in particular the aspiring member states in Eastern Europe will have to do before there can be any prospect of enlargement. And that will take time. The question is, can these countries remain without the protection of a security framework in the interim? Without losing sight of the connection between the enlargement of the EU and NATO, this means that the enlargement of NATO should be higher on the agenda, although the Netherlands would always prefer the two processes to run parallel. The watchwords here are caution and persuasiveness. It must be made clear to Russia that the enlargement of NATO is not directed against anyone, but is in fact aimed at promoting the stability of Europe as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, let me repeat that I hope to work as a Dutchman, as a European, towards a full-scale political partnership between the United States and Europe. In the end, such a partnership could culminate in a Euro-Atlantic community based on two parallel structures. One with which both parties have been long familiar to protect our common defense and security interests, and the other to look after shared political and economic interests. Defense and security alone are too narrow a basis for the transatlantic structure we need today. And that goes to show that transatlantic relations are moving towards a higher level of maturity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Prime Minister. We'll have a, a number of uh, foreign affairs questions and uh, some other social questions in Europe. Maybe we could begin. Uh, uh, a lot of Americans understand that uh, the Netherlands is uh, always fighting against nature in, the, in its uh, dike system. There's been a lot of flooding in, uh, in recent months. Maybe you could give us an update on it. And also, understand five years ago there was a plan to uh, upgrade the dikes and that it was not done in part because of, uh, of uh, environmental uh, pressure. And I wanted to ask you if you thought that uh, upgrading them is a good idea now. Well, let me first of all use this opportunity to thank uh, all of, of, of you and, and 
uh, the, the leadership of, of, uh, of this country uh, included uh, President Clinton for the solidarity and uh, the uh, message of, uh, of, uh, of solidarity we got during the days and the weeks where, where, where the problems were there. Uh, we could have been close to a disaster uh, if the dikes would not have been strong enough. So most luckily, all these people, 250,000 of people who had to be evacuated out of parts of the country could return to their places, to their houses, without any real problem apart of, well, the, of course, the fact that it's not, 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 not emotionally and socially not, not nice to be part of such a process. So, so it could have been much worse. But this uh, uh, event has shown how uh, riskful life uh, for uh, people behind the dikes is. And we have a long-standing tradition uh, as far as our defense against the sea is concerned. The famous Delta works in the Netherlands. And now we said, uh, from that moment on, uh, where the floods were coming and the evacuation took place, we need a Delta plan, Delta works for the river dikes. And that will be done quickly now on the basis of urgency legislation. Uh, uh, quite some people underestimated perhaps the risk of um, uh, two weak dikes and uh, also some people uh, uh, thought that it could take quite some time uh, in terms of procedures, etc. So we decided to have uh, 150 kilometers dikes strengthened and uh, uh, make them stronger indeed in the next uh, year, in this year already, on the basis of urgency legislation and that makes clear that uh, we take our responsibility and um, uh, that can increase the uh, sense of uh, protection and security people should have in the fight against nature because uh, there we should do what we can and we do what we can. Thank you. Questioner asks, uh, Prime Minister, you spoke about a full-scale political partnership between the U.S. and Europe. He wants to go just a little bit further to see if you're in favor of an actual special treaty between the United States and Europe, or beginning with the United States and the Netherlands. I don't think it's necessary to do this on the basis of treaties. In various fields, uh, treaties can be important. It's, uh, I think, uh, mainly important that uh, we share uh, common responsibility um, in terms of, uh, of uh, improving security and uh, uh, policies all over Europe for the reasons I mentioned. Eastern Europe is uh, not uh, just something to be, to be dealt with by, by us in Western Europe, which is a shared responsibility for the US and, and Europe and in the economic field. Uh, cooperation is highly uh, wanted, is necessary, and in the meantime, of course, each of us, even if we cooperate more strongly between Europe and the US, we should never forget that uh, regional cooperation should not be a block, a fortress Europe, as we, as we hear it sometimes, or fortress Europe and North America. No, we should work together and be open at the same time in order to not to, uh, to, to, to block the process into the direction of uh, real, uh, global, open, free trade, international relations. Thank you. In the United States, social security is a very sensitive topic. Uh, I understand that in the Netherlands, for economic reasons, it's pretty much a a to accompli that uh, your social security system is going to be changed. And uh, from your perspective, sir, of your party, which has been a supporter of a uh, large social security uh, net, uh, how do you feel about actually to be the one to have to implement it? Uh, well, it's an absolutely an absolute necessity all over Europe. Uh, to be uh, more competitive. Uh, we speak about Europe without borders. We have an international society without borders, uh, capital uh, flow, capital movements, uh, high-tech, uh, low-labor countries. So if you want to be competitive on the short run and on the long run, uh, you have to have a close look into the possibilities to put your house in order in terms of uh, fiscal policy and also reduce uh, taxes and social premiums. And that can be done by, indeed, restructuring also parts of the social security system. And uh, I say this also as a social democrat. If we want to ensure that the weakest people in society uh, have the certainty that they can make use of social protection on the long run, 
then you must be very critical in terms of how does the system today work. Is it not so that too many people make use of the, uh, of the security schemes? Is it not so that, that elements that started as social policy are just um, becoming uh, elements uh, where people are not active enough, where incentives are not there? So every time again, you have to find a balance between protection for those who need it and uh, giving incentives to those uh, not only employed workers but also employers to take responsibility, to take new initiative, starting companies, uh, taking risks. And I think nobody has the blueprint for, for, the, for the final approach there. Every society is, is changing, uh, mentality is changing, cultural changing have influence on all this. And uh, I think that uh, we in the Netherlands would not like to live, the overwhelming majority of our people not like to live in a country where um, uh, the differences between prosperity and poverty are too large. So economic uh, flexibility, economic modernization, competitiveness, okay, deregulation, okay, but uh, not below the minimum. Not in such a way that too many people, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people uh, hear about prosperity but don't have any part in it. And that is where we uh, try to find the balance every time again. And in my view, it is uh, he, he sometimes, this is my last word on this, uh, things you like the most uh, must be considered in a critical way. I mean, if you want to take care of social protection on the longer run, then you have to have a very close look into a lack of effectiveness. Because the more expensive the system becomes, the more easy it will be for right-wing politicians to say, let's get rid of it. So that is one of my, uh, one of my reasons to... <laughs> To, to, to protect the system and to, to keep it out of the wrong hands. On to uh, some uh, world affairs questions. Would the Netherlands now support uh, the membership of Russia in NATO? And also, if you could um, speak a little bit about how you see the uh, evolution of NATO and whether or not you think it's needed anymore. Uh, NATO is, is absolutely needed, uh, but in this, uh, uh, in this period, uh, not so much as an, uh, as an instrument against, but as a uh, contribution um, uh, supporting uh, and, 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 and creating stability and, um, in the world, in Europe and elsewhere. That's my first remark. The second remark is that membership of Russia is not at stake. As Russians, as the Russian president as the Russian government. But the point is that Central and Eastern European countries want to have the perspective that if not at the short run, at least in a few years, there will be a possibility for them to live in our, in a common European house. And as I said in my speech, in my statement, uh, we in the Netherlands are in favor of a parallel approach, enlarging the European Union and also enlarging NATO. Uh, how different uh, the, the various aspects around these two elements are, but we are in favor of a parallel process. And we want to indeed, step by step, work towards an enlarged NATO. Speaking about Russia, I think um, we should do what we can and the United States should do what it can, and that can be done together in order to make clear to Russia that, first of all, an enlarged NATO is not a threat vis-a-vis -vis the, the former Soviet Union, and on the other hand, that Russia should not be in a position to veto such a development. That they should understand what our wish and the wish of the people in Central and Eastern Europe is. And if we do that in a careful way, and if the United States shows the leadership we need together with the US in that process, then I'm optimistic for the future. Thank you. Uh, besides the uh, Vice Prime Minister on the head table here, who is it that you support to uh, head the World Trade Organization? Is this a serious question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, who, it's who not the serious question. Huh? Yeah, okay. No, we had in the in the in the in the in the process the candidates. You know, there are three candidates, and the European Union uh, supports the Italian uh, candidate, Mr. Ruggiero. And uh, we understand that in the in the present situation there is a almost a deadlock because uh, uh, votes and votes again show that that between the three candidates, uh, uh, no none of none of them can 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 count on, on, on a consensus uh, vote, so that really creates a problem. But here again, uh, Mr. Ruggiero is, is the man we supported until now, and uh, we are continuing to support. Thank you. A couple of uh, social questions in your country. Does the Netherlands have attacks on abortion clinics, as we often have here in the United States? How do you handle this situation, and what is your government's position? The whole climate around this issue has become uh, very quiet now. We have had turbulent years, and I think now the whole matter of abortion, when yes, when no, and how to do, normalized. Not a problem at all. Okay. Questioner asks, Prime Minister, is your government alarmed with the growth of the right neo-Nazi political movements in Germany? Well, the problem is more serious than just Germany. We see that all over, uh, all over Europe, uh, in a number of countries, uh, uh, forms of nationalism and, and, and extremism uh, has, have developed. And I think uh, each hour of the day, we should uh, uh, warn our people, uh, give the information about, uh, about the years before the Second World War, the, uh, the, the rise of the Nazi regime in the 30s. Now, within, within a few months, we will have the 50th anniversary of our liberation in the Netherlands. And at that occasion, for that occasion, we offer the 50th uh, bell of the Carillon, of the Dutch Carillon, here to, to President Clinton. So let us not separate the feeling of pride that we are, they have been liberated 50 years ago and the reason why this, why this war was necessary, why this war came up. So let, never, let that never come again. And let us not too easily mistake that this is just a problem. Germany, it's a problem all over various European countries. And we cannot be critical in that. This is concerned. Thank you. <clears throat> Legalization of drugs in the Netherlands has been a success. There's been pressure from some of your neighbors, particularly uh, Belgians, that uh, uh, some of your programs are, are far too aimed at uh, helping the victim uh, of uh, drug abuse and uh, not trying to uh, uh, stop uh, uh, what they call drug tourism, of people coming to the Netherlands to experiment with drugs. Uh, there is a lot of, lots of misunderstanding about this issue. Um, sometimes even in neighboring countries, in, in countries like Belgium and Germany, and, and if I read the, the press here, uh, also sometimes in the publicity here, uh, there, is, there is no legalization of, of drugs in Netherlands. Of course, we have to uh, tackle and of problems that have to be solved everywhere. Uh, I think nobody has the medical solution how to find a balanced answer to this uh, problem of drug abuse, uh, to uh, uh, the, 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 the drug change and, and the trade in drugs and, and how to deal with it. Um, so with us, soft drugs have not been realized. It's not the case that for all those who use heroin get a free uh, heroin at their disposal. Uh, there are discussions if within certain, within, under strict conditions, um, under strict, strict medical conditions, uh, in, in certain, certain experimental cases, uh, ability should be used, but not as a general scheme, not as a general system. So uh, we uh, work uh, every day of the week together with our neighboring countries to, uh, to, to, to give a good answer problem, which is in fact a problem for each of us. And nobody, uh, also the, the French and the Germans and the Belgians, no has the final solution. And we are very careful in this. And I would like to use this opportunity to to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, accept me that the way in which the Dutch uh, systems are described sometimes in the press are uh, purely over exaggerated, not in fact uh, giving the real facts. Uh, thank you. On, a, um, on another social question regarding the Netherlands, can you tell us about your country's position on physician related suicide? Has it been officially sanctioned? officially allowed or permitted? Euthanasia? Euthanasia, yes. On euthanasia, uh, on euthanasia uh, I should say that uh, this is uh, 
uh, forbidden by law and that only in some very, um, very carefully defined cases uh, in the terminal uh, stage of, of people's lives, um, uh, exceptions uh, are possible within, within that framework. But the, the main rule is and remains that euthanasia is forbidden by law. And that also should be made very clear here. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, we have a question about uh, uh, entrance of countries into world markets. Should the nations of the world establish acceptable levels of environmental practice as a condition of entry into world markets? Uh, developed countries are entering into world markets, um, uh, of course, with lower wages, lower labor costs, sometimes less legislation, le less uh, environmental legislation. But that, in my view, is not, not a reason to keep them out. Um, uh, sometimes uh, people are concerned, say, well, OK, you should use the multilateral system in order to encourage uh, countries to, uh, to, to apply the ILO standards as far as social conditions are concerned or environmental standards. And in principle, that's OK. But let uh, the difference in wages and social standards also not be an alibi for richer countries, for developed countries, to protect themselves. Because that easily become a defensive approach and not the right way in order to, uh, to, uh, to develop uh, on a global uh, and, and uh, balanced uh, way. <clears throat> Thank you. Part of being prime minister is, all, is uh, dealing with very sensitive political matters of state, uh, but it's also a, a job of a salesman where you uh, promote uh, your, your country and the great aspects of your country. Questioner asks, other than visions of everyone wearing wooden shoes, what is the biggest misconception that Americans have about the Dutch? <laughs> One of the biggest uh, misconceptions uh, of the Americans uh, by the Americans of the Dutch is, apart from what I said already on, uh, on, on, on drugs and on UCI, uh, perhaps that, uh, that we are more permissive than we are. I think, uh, and I say this with a certain pride, because uh, indeed, uh, and during a certain period, we have been too soft. And uh, in a number of ways, uh, the balance between, between environment and, and protection and uh, also other fields has been found again. So and more to, to the members of the Dutch cabinets, invite them, uh, uh, ask them to come in the press club, and the, the no misconception anymore. <laughs> A lot of Americans aren't uh, entirely familiar with the uh, government structure of the Netherlands. It's always a coalition government, and uh, which uh, involves a lot of compromise between the different parties. Do you think the government coalition that you lead will survive a breakout? What are you doing to keep the coalition together? Well, first of all, indeed, we always need coalitions. No party has, uh, has the luxury of being, uh, being in a majority position. So all the time, uh, two or even three parties are necessary to form a coalition. Uh, this coalition is a, is a uh, remarkable one, not, not because of the name of the coalition, but because of the fact that this is the first time since 75 or 80 years that Christian Democrats do not participate in, in government. Uh, so that is new for, 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 for public opinion and sometimes even new for the politicians themselves or for some of them. Um, uh, I think the best uh, way to put a coalition together is to do your work and, and try to explain uh, every day of the week again what the choices are and what your long-term long visions are, in what framework are difficult choices made because uh, policies are not popular. Of course not. You have to make difficult choices, but make the direction clear you want to go. And um, I have a good hope that this, uh, this coalition of three parties will hold until 19, uh, 1998. 19, uh, uh, what is it? Oh, far away. Four, four years from now. <laughs> Thanks. If I could go back to uh, your answer on one question about the, uh, uh, the enduring need of NATO. Um, the, question, the questioner asked a follow-up question. If you could identify the potential enemies which may require the type of security arrangements you referred to uh, with the continuance of NATO. 
What, uh, what are some of the potential conflicts where you think that uh, uh, NATO might be called in and that everyone would have been thankful that it was uh, kept going? Well, I, I think it's not so much a matter of, of, of enemies, although, although you can never exclude uh, developments in the five or ten years to come, but let me perhaps say a few words on what I mean uh, about stability. Um, look at former Yugoslavia as the, as the main dramatic example of what, what, what can happen if, if um, uh, suppression is not there anymore, but, but ethnic conflicts start to monopolize uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, personally, I fear uh, developments that might happen elsewhere on the Balkan. We know we know the pa the past long ago, and we know how how problematic the relations and situations are there. And I would say, let NATO uh, try to be enlarged, but also now already be an instrument uh, trying to. To, to ensure uh, peace and stability in these parts of Europe where we know from the past and know from the present that stability is not a um, uh, not, uh, it speaks not, does not speak for itself uh, uh, so that the, the, the enemies or the dangers are more that type of danger than that you can put your finger to certain countries and say well there the enemy is the, the problem is the, the instability and, and the, the risk of ethnic conflicts and everything, and there, former Yugoslavia, where we all have bad feeling, of course, and more than that, uh, should only teach us that we have to make a better performance in order to, well, to strengthen peace and stability in our part of the world. Thank you. We have time for uh, two more questions. I'd like to ask you a more difficult one first. What is the state of uh, your relationship with Indonesia? Can there be any third party uh, involved to ease the human rights issues in East Timor? Our relation to Indonesia is a good one. Um, um, uh, uh, of course, after, um, after the, 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 the independence of Indonesia, immediately after, uh, in, in 1945, in August 1945, uh, it is uh, important also to uh, look uh, back in a clear and open way to that part of our future. Uh, on Indonesia, uh, there have been uh, difficulties on, on human rights, and you mentioned the point of East Timor, of course. That creates a lot of problems. I still hope, sincerely hope, that through uh, international diplomacy, international uh, uh, um, uh, consultation, it will be possible to also to solve these uh, minority uh, of these, uh, these human rights problems. But it is, uh, in, in, in fact, especially for the Dutch, a difficult problem. Because as soon as we start uh, uh, making strong statements about that, if not part of, of international protests, then Indonesia would easily say, oh, well, there they are again. And they had us before, so let, let, they, let, let them not exaggerate. So I hope that the United States and all the others in the world will take this element of human rights into full account together with us in the UN machinery, etc. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. I'd like to uh, present to you a uh, certificate of appreciation from the National Press Club. It's signed by President of the Press Club, Monroe Carmen. And, uh, we also have, you have a long flight back, I know, and here's a, a book of photography. Uh, George Thames, a very famous American uh, photographer for a long time with the New York Times, and a lot of his photographs are, uh, hang here in the club. And uh, as well, you mentioned that you're going to see Bob Dole uh, this afternoon. I don't know what he might give you, but we're going to give you a coffee mug. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. And a final... Uh, the final questioner from the beer part of the crowd asks, for those of us who like Heineken beer, please tell us if any of our more pedestrian American beers are popular in the Netherlands. No, I would, I would hope that 
I would have hoped that you would give me the opportunity to give a very polite answer to the last question, but this makes it impossible to me. <laughs> There's nothing above Heineken. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, have a good day.